Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. America stands at a crossroads in its relationship with guns. On one side, many gun owners want few or no restrictions. On the other side, some want to abolish legal ownership of guns completely. America's division over guns is most evident in political and religious debate. Political parties are sharply divided. Religious Americans armed with sacred texts and theological ideas occupy opposite fields of the dueling ground. Christian evangelicals especially are at a precarious crossroads, if not in dangerous crisis. If the national discussion on guns needs anything, it needs a reasonable approach to counter the highly charged atmosphere generated wherever the topic comes up. Michael Austin is the professor of philosophy at Eastern Kentucky University. He's the author of numerous books and online writings on ethical and religious questions. He believes that Christian ethics are relevant to all of life. He blogs at Psychology Today and has posted articles at such journals as Sports Ethics and Philosophy, a Journal of Applied Philosophy, Philosophia Christi, and many others. Joining us now to talk about his new book, God and Guns in America, is Michael Austin. Michael, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Well, we're glad to open up Monday morning with such a lighthearted topic, one that will just uh, engage everyone and uh, looking for uh, the entertainment factor. But this is uh, a very serious, critical, biblical thought matter when you consider the Christian life, the believer's walk. Okay. Uh, is is a gun, Second Amendment, an alien of right? Uh, is it uh, a gun for the purpose of self-protection, for an armed militia, uh, as the, the Second Amendment says? Uh, what brought you into this debate? Yeah, I was just doing some reading, and it's like a lot of the things I start to think about and write about, just something catches my eye as a really good argument or for something that most people reject or a bad argument. And I just came across, I think initially it was just some people sort of using text from the Bible to support their views, and they were radically different, right? Some people use parts of Scripture to, like, a absolute, no limit, Second Amendment kind of perspective. Others, a pacifist or a nonviolent perspective, and they each marshal... Uh, Bible verses. So sometimes it seemed really clear to me the verses were misused. Other times I wasn't sure. And so I got motivated uh, to start looking at it. So I did a little online writing and then ended up uh, writing this book when I realized there wasn't a lot out there. So I sort of fell into it, but hopefully Providence in the midst of all that. Well, I, th I think it's an important topic, and you're right. Um, <clears throat> I, I interview between six and 800 authors a year. Uh, and this is our fourth year of doing this, so uh, I see you know, almost every new release that comes out in Christian nonfiction from every major publisher, and in the four years and thousands of pitches to get to pick six or eight hundred a year, uh, we probably go through four or five thousand books a year and winnowing down to who it is we're going to interview. And this is the first of its kind to cross my desk. And so when it came in, when the pitch came in, I looked at it, I said, first of all, uh, I think it's definitely something that our audience needs to um, consider because for, here I am 45 years in the Bible Belt. Uh, guns are a part of the culture. There's uh, hunting season. Uh, you can tell hunting season because people grow a beard uh, <laughs> who don't normally wear a beard. I mean, there are signs of hunting season coming, and then the Facebook posts are all about the big buck and about the, the hunting. Uh, but in the case of what's been going on with mass shootings, with school shootings, with synagogue shootings, with church shootings, it brings up an important deba debate about uh, the rightful biblical interpretation in context 
of what was written at the time it was written, and then how do we process that through a 21st century lens? We first have to exam examine it in context. So the idea of weapons uh, introduced a long time ago. Right? The making of weapons was, was uh, early, early on in the Bible. That was for the purpose of hunting and of course there was a military strategy involved in taking territory, defeating the enemy. Uh, it is the history of the Israelites uh, that God was going to go before us. There were going to be battles. There have been many battles uh, even into this century. So we have the Constitution here in the United States that gives us a Second Amendment right that looking at it in context, which would be the rightful interpretation to go to the starting point, it's one of the amendments that doesn't really take you very deep into the thought process of the Founding Fathers. That leaves a lot of room. It's kind of, kind of my statement about the Old Testament. God tells us a lot of things to do. He doesn't necessarily tell us how to do them. And so the Second Amendment is kind of here's what you're supposed to do, but we're not going to tell you how to do it. And that's where I think a lot of the debate comes in. So from your perspective, what was really your starting point for this from a uh, research and trying to frame this into a cohesive thought pattern where you actually argue both sides of the equation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it started with, like, my main focus was from a, a Christian ethical perspective grounded in the Bible. So I really wanted to look in depth at what scriptures say. And, of course, these are, I mean, guns, of course, are controversial in America. And then you bring in all these issues from scripture about about self-defense, about weapons, the use of violence. When is it permissible, if ever? Um, the Second Amendment and, and sort of history of guns in America, I looked at that some. Uh, just enough to sort of set the stage because it's a focused on, on our country uh, but the arguments are mainly focused on scripture and Christian thought and so I think it's clear at least from I mean it's clear from the Supreme Court that in 2008 and 2010 I believe a couple of different decisions made it clear that the interpretation for now at least and is that it's an individual right uh, grounded in self-defense that's the law and of course that's important and as both as Christians and as Americans the Constitution is I mean, obviously important to us, but the deeper, more fundamental question for us is going to be, what does Christ think? What do the scriptures tell us? And so that was my way in, thinking about violence in general in the scriptures, looking at um, some of the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, where, where violence is used, and then trying to draw out what God says about it. And then you look at the New Testament and, and some of the different ways that, that it's discussed. So yeah, it was it's a big topic. Uh, and of course, there are people who love the scriptures, love God, who have different views here. And so, and that's sort of par partly, partially why I kind of landed in the middle, but more towards the nonviolence part, because I think that's the overall trend of scripture moving that direction. But I couldn't just say that violence was never permissible, um, given what I, what I read and what I came to believe. What's so interesting to me about this particular debate is that We've legislated the premeditated taking of a life in the womb. That is defined in the Bible as murder. The premeditated taking of a life. That was the commandment. Thou shalt not murder. And it was very clear. Murder was a premeditated action. If my axe head flew off while I was cutting wood and killed you, that was not premeditated, that didn't fall in the category of murder, and actually there were provisions for me to go to a sanctuary city and get a fair trial. Um, and uh, um, we look at guns and, and all these moral issues uh, as separate, but they're really not separate. 
they're about the gospel, they're about living the Christian life, they're about the moral compass, so the rosette on that compass. Is it dead center? If it's dead center, that's Christ in the middle. That's your, that's your rosette. Everything is, is from that perspective. Uh, but we have people on both sides of the fence in the abortion issue as we do in the gun issue. So we have, and, and in the LGBT issue, we have people claiming to be gay Christians. We have Christians who support abortion. We have Christians that support uh, guns. And then we have the other side that don't support LGBT, don't support abortion, and don't support guns. So is, is there a clear theology in these matters which is uh, applicable uh, because even within Christendom there's not a lot of agreement on tradition or on pract um, orthopraxy or any of that. Uh, so then you come to this issue of guns in America and this has become a sacred debate as to the right of an individual to own a gun. From a theological perspective as you talk to different people in your research, what did you find that was the compelling argument for them? Uh, what were the scriptures that you heard most commonly referenced? Yeah, I think, you know, for people who are, who tend towards the pacifist or nonviolent side, they'll look at the Sermon on the Mount, they'll, they'll look at the life of Jesus, his willingness to endure verbal and physical persecution and of course death um, telling Peter to put his sword away that those who live by the sword will die by the sword on the other side um, people that tend more towards the, the generally speaking the pro-gun kind of idea is you look at the Old Testament violence was part of um, the life of Israel and sometimes at God's command or God's permission um, and a lot of people a lot of people will look at Luke 22 and this is one of the first one of the first passages that I noticed came up a lot where Jesus is t giving them instructions before the crucifixion, his disciples, and he says, uh, if you have a cloak, sell it, right, and buy a sword. And then the, the disciple, and then he quotes Deuteronomy about being numbered amongst the transgressors. The disciples say, here are two swords, Lord, and he says, that's enough. So that's one that, in the New Testament, I would say that's the primary self-defense passage that I saw a lot of people use. Um, and there are at least four different interpretations of that passage. Uh, I come down on the view that what he's doing there is, is is ensuring that he will be seen as a transgressor of Roman law by being armed. And, and there are a lot of, there's disagreement about that, so I don't want to say that it's just clear cut, but that's what I thought in the book and what I still think is the strongest interpretation. Um, some of the other interpretations that, that want to avoid it as self-defense do seem a little a bit of a stretch to me, like they make it too symbolic or metaphorical. I don't get that from the context. But this one takes the context and the passage seriously. Um, so I would say that's a main one. People say he's telling them to be armed for self-defense. And, and I just don't think that's the heart of it. It's an enigmat enigmatic passage. So anyone that just says it's easy to figure out, I'm immediately skeptical because it's, it's one of those difficult sayings of Jesus. And, and the context helps. But, but there are plausible lines of argument from more than one interpretation, but I think that one's the strongest, um, just taking the text at face value. So let's put that in context because this is one of the areas where uh, contextual looking at the context of the life and times of Jesus this is before the New Testament is written, so there's no New Testament at the time of Jesus. Uh, right. Israel is under Roman siege. Rome is in power. Uh, they are rising in power and they're afraid of rebellion. So they're um, constantly in a state of uh, quote unquote law enforcement, if you will. Uh, ultimately, the destruction of the Second Temple comes along. You have the last vestige of the rebels escape to Masada. 
and the story of Masada is a powerful one that if you don't know the story, uh, you should look at that story because I take a look at that story in the context of it, which is these were uh, the last almost 1,000 of the rebels that escaped from, uh, from Rome, camped out and where Herod had his uh, winter uh, palace. Uh, there was plenty of food, there was plenty of water, there was plenty of money, there were plenty of weapons, but they chose to take their own lives rather than be defeated and subjected to slavery uh, under the hand of Rome. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful story. If you've never seen it in an audience, if you've never seen the movie Masada, read the book Masada, or been to Masada, uh, you can certainly go there with me every year we make that trip. But as I fast forward that from an end time prophetic standpoint, there is another one coming who is going to want to subject mankind to his dominion. And we're talking about the Antichrist. So uh, setting aside the debate, are you gonna be here, not be here, uh, as a whole another issue where there's five camps all equally divided, and they all can't be right. So um, let's say you are here and you're faced with a confrontation of uh, being forced to take a mark or you flee to some secure place, but yet you are now in a position where you hear advancing people trying to force the mark or die. Or there is a, um, a large Islamic uh, move in America that is related to jihad by immigration, migration, and ultimately Sharia. And this also becomes uh, a plausible, foreseeable, historical, and biblical uh, concept. Uh, in that case, uh, could I look at that and say, should I be prepared for such a scenario. And if I'm going to be prepared for such a scenario, I understand the buying of five years worth of oats and people putting away uh, canned goods and people, all of that, they also are storing ammunition and guns in preparation for survival. Had, did that come up in your uh, discussions and in your evaluation from a end time prophetic outlook. Yeah, not really the end time. So more, maybe the more general approach and principles that would, would guide someone in that time. Um, so my, the questions and sort of the, the people that I read and interacted with, the focus was more on in general, when, if and when self-defense or defense of other people with a lethal weapon is is sort of morally justified? Um, are there cases where it is, somewhere it's not? And so I was trying to ask that more, that bigger question, which would have relevance for, for the kind of scenarios you're talking about. Um, but it more has more, to, it's really more that basic question, like if we're, we're supposed to be followers of Christ, imitators of Christ, what, what, what would he do in these situations? And what does that mean for us, trying to have those same character traits that he did, which includes courage, but also humility, compassion, long suffering, all those virtues that, you know, we like some of them, we don't like others, um, because some of them are, I mean, a little more praised in our culture, and even in our church, others require a different kind of sacrifice. So, uh, but yeah, I think that's worth thinking about, just trying to have a full scriptural view of these kind of questions. Some things that occur to me while you're talking about this in this, in this debate is that uh, you have to be willing to lay down your life for me. If we're talking about Christian persecution, you're being persecuted because you're a believer in Jesus, which as a Jew who came to faith 25 years ago and made a public proclamation, declaration, went on uh, to seminary, was ordained as a start a congregation, it was a very public decision. I knew that I would come under Jewish persecution uh, for my faith as well as put myself in the line uh, in the camp with Christian persecution. However, uh, if, if I'm looking at the scriptures correctly, me giving my life uh, for Christ, 
being willing to die uh, for him uh, puts me in the category of the martyrs of Revelation to be raised up first. So there's kind of a position of honor for those. And in that case, it doesn't justify me shooting back. It justifies me taking a bullet for Messiah if I'm truly uh, believing that that's what the call is, I have to be willing to lay down my life for him. So in that scenario, uh, how do we weigh self-defense? Is, it self, mm -hmm. is self-defense justified if somebody's robbing me versus self-defense uh, or lack of self-defense if somebody's persecuting me for my faith? Yeah, I think I think uh, in my own view, and of course there are people that disagree that, and I understand. But I think the burden of I think our initial stance, whether it's persecution or any situation, is is that we're gonna we opt for nonviolence. We opt to yeah to to suffer um, being harmed or killed uh, for sure in the persecution sense, right? So if I'm being persecuted for my faith. I mean, I can't say what I would do because I'm not in that kind of life and death situation. But I hope and pray that the day comes, I'd be willing to give my life because I think I think that's the model he set. That's that's the highest form of courage for me is the courage of the martyr, and not just for me, but from you know, look at Christ's life and Christian thought. In the situation where, like, if I'm being robbed, I, I mean, I'd actually think in that case, I sh we should just allow someone to take our property because even if it's a you know, they're a criminal, they're still made in God's image, they have the same basic value as you or I. Where it gets difficult is, I don't know if somebody's in my house just to rob me or to harm me, or even more importantly, you know, a family member. And so, so that's where I think the self-defense, and even more importantly, defense of vulnerable others, like, you know, my wife and children, for example, that becomes a harder question. Um, and it's something, honestly, you can probably, if the book, you can tell that I struggle with it, so I'm going to come down that there are exceptions, right, to this nonviolence. I think, I think you can make a case that that's one. But I do, I have definitely moved more to the nonviolent side, even in those positions, but not fully. But I, as I read the scriptures, as I look at God's attitudes, as they expresses towards violence, even in the Old Testament, where people tend to have this caricature of, you know, God being a violent God. And of course, there's violence there, but, but even there, right, there's, God condemns violence. He won't let David build a temple because he's shed blood. And so there's this there's this thread of violence as a either disallowed or as a very last resort that I think we have to take more seriously than we do. Do you recall the case in Atlanta <clears throat> uh, in the courtroom? A prisoner broke free, grabbed the gun of the bailiff, killed. Um, one or two, I'm not sure how many, mm -hmm. uh, but was talked down uh, and relinquished his gun because someone shared the gospel with him. Yeah, I do remember that. I, th I believe I write about that some in the book, if memory serves, because he, um, he ended up in this woman's apartment and she was reading portions of Rick Warren's The Purpose Driven Life and talking about God and Christ and the gospel and he ended up letting her leave, and then she got to her car and called the police. Um, and I think that's something that, that was interesting as I did research, and even since the book's been published, there are a lot of stories like that where someone used a, a nonviolent way to deal with the threat of violence, and it was actually successful. Now, not always, of course, but, but I think as we look at history and then even those kind of individual cases, um, we, we, we can see the power of God there as well. Um, and. I think we opt towards violence, at least this is my own kind of perspective from growing up in American culture. I mean, I grew up high school in the 80s when, you know, Miami Vice and all the police and, you know, some of my favorite movies, um, Tombstone, Gladiator, all those things. And so we're kind of shaped and formed to violence being the solution. And of course, violence has, in some ways, been the solution. It stopped evil in the world over the centuries, unquestionably. But um, yeah, I think there are these other creative ways um, in Christ that, that we should look at as well. And so, yeah, there's plenty of stories like that where people are talked down or um, convinced or they just give up. And so we want, we want to at least try that first if we can, would be my argument. You know, there's the argument of nature versus nurture in the rearing of children. 
then there's the argument here of um, am I an American first, claiming the rights granted to me by the Constitution, or am I a believer first, and I'm looking through a biblical lens and evaluating issues like this through a scriptural lens of the mind of Messiah. In the arena of looking at it through a Christian lens brings into consideration that statistically, not my statistic, Barner's statistic and Pew uh, research that 80% of church goers don't read their Bibles. So they basically know what their pastor has told them. The pastor, except for uh, the uh, Jerry Falwell um, mandate of, uh, at Liberty University uh, was for each one of the students to take a class. Uh, there hasn't been that much spoken from the pulpit. It seems to be that um, in this particular area, you're just an American. You're not an American Christian, or you're not a Christian first, you're an American first, and therefore the Second Amendment applies to you. And that's the only litmus test for this. D have you found that to be the leaning towards this debate? Yeah, I think that's right. I think you know, people will, will lean towards kind of the culture they grew up in. So I grew up in the Midwest, um, I'm sort of a hunting culture in my family, and then here in the South, and I know it's true in other regions of the country that gun culture has turned into a self-defense, you know, armed citizen kind of thing. And I find Christians, their first sort of defense of that view is to go to kind of some kind of a slogan or maybe about the Second Amendment and and not looking first and foremost at what as as a Christian, what Scripture says, what Christ would do, and so I think that can be a difficult thing. I think that that people will, um, yeah, I just think we have to be careful. And this is for people across the political spectrum, right? We tend to put other form, other aspects of who we are, uh, take on too much importance. So of course, it's I mean, think about the personal level. It's central to me that I'm a husband, that I'm a father. Um, and that I'm an American, that I'm from Kansas City, those are things that are important to me, but those aren't the core part of who I am. The core part has got to be a, a follower of Christ, and so that's going to, no matter what, because we live in a fallen world, being a Christian is going to put me in tension with being American at some point, right, given that America is a, it's a great place, but it's not perfect, obviously, in many ways. So I think that's important to look at the scriptures and try to, step out of this debate. I think one thing that I thought of when you're asking that question, I've talked to pastors, uh, I'm thinking of one in West Virginia where he started to raise this issue um, with the, some of his parishioners, and it was just, it was like a, you just don't bring up that issue. You don't, because we don't, we don't want to, our views about guns to be challenged or brought under scrutiny. And so I think it's really highly emotional. It's just one of those, as people know, um, one of those really contentious hot issues that if you want to get a good argument going or a bad argument going, um, you get people on different sides of it and, and it can get testy pretty quickly. So yeah, I think that's a, it's a hot button and a lot of pastors understandably are afraid to touch about it. I think we have to because there are roughly 40,000 people a year now in the United States die from gun violence, two thirds of those roughly by suicide. There's a lot of room for what the, for the church to come in and and reduce that. So we can't just ignore it. I agree. Uh, we're <clears throat> talking with Michael Austin, author of a new book called God and Guns in America. It is written by a philosophy professor, uh, one who uh, weighs the mind of uh, what, what are the foundational truths? What are your truths? And how do you act upon those truths and in helping frame an understanding of the truth that people use in either being for or against gun ownership. Uh, we're going to take a short break and when we come back on the other side we're going to talk about degrees because this is an issue that has degrees. Uh, having a small handgun versus having an assault rifle uh, are on quite a different spectrum and 
Uh, is this something that um, is a matter of degrees or is this uh, gray or is this black and white? Uh, how do we parse all this in relationship to living life as a believer? And we'll talk more about that on the other side of this break. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and my special featured guests twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops, and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black and Sean Tabbitt for in-depth insights into Israel, prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on ignitinganation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Kanan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. We're talking with Michael Austin, author of a new book, God and Guns in America. Michael, welcome back. Thank you. We, early in the, uh, the segment, we were talking about culture. Uh, I grew up in the Jewish community of Pittsburgh, and in the 50s, we were the first post-Holocaust generation. Guns were were something that were not a part of a vocabulary. We had just come out of the worst persecution and um, horror of the Holocaust uh, that, that we had, had ever known. One third of the Jewish population decimated at the hands of an agenda that was an agenda of hate. And um, anti-Semitism still uh, is a huge issue uh, even within Christian circles that believe in a Jewish Messiah, but have an issue with the Jewish people or with Israel. Uh, so the first time I ever uh, was advised to get a gun was after coming south. Uh, I came south 45 years ago, but when I came to Alabama and there was a death threat made, uh, I got a phone call and somebody threatened my life. Uh, it happened more than one time, and the FBI said, you know, maybe you should think about getting a gun. And that was, that was a, a decision that was really hard for me to reconcile. Uh, so just walking into a gun store was just so, uh, I must have looked like a lost, a, a lost kid. Here I'm a 60-year-old man in my late 50s. Uh, 
walking around, looking around, and, and you know, somebody literally said, are you lost? And I said, I, I, I am. Um, here's the advice I've been given. And he was a retired police officer, and he said, well, then let me walk you through and help you understand, because I, this was something that, that uh, I knew nothing, I mean nothing about. I had never been hunting, I had never held a gun, I knew nothing about it whatsoever. Uh, so culture, uh, even within Christianity, plays a part in this. Uh, what implications does a Christian who owns a gun, how does that impact their character? What does it speak to the character of the person? Yeah, and that's something I, that we have to be really careful about because, it well, it's going to depend on the person, but I think we have to just pay attention to it. So, for example, I recently was talking with a, a newer friend of mine. He's a re retired NFL player, um, has a gun, and, and he started realizing the way his mindset would change, right? Almost like when he left with the gun, it was like, yeah, someone tried to mess with me. And so we want to we want to guard against that. Now, he still owns a gun, but he's working on, you know, before God and by the Spirit, changing that. There are, what I'm concerned about with Christians is not that if you have a gun for self-defense, that means your character is flawed. That's not my argument at all. My argument is that, like a lot of things, there's a danger for it to have, it could reveal a character flaw, or it could even feed into some um, character flaw. So here, here's an example of this. Um, notice people, I've seen this myself, and some of the people I read for the book talked about this, where Christians brag about the stopping power of their new 9mm, or talk about how you shouldn't mess with their wife because she's got a gun, she'll put you down. And regardless of what your views are, right, if you decide you're going to carry a gun for self-defense, you do that before God and led by the Spirit, I, you know, what we need to then do is realize that's still a tragedy in the sense that we live in a world where, you know, well, in your own story, right, where your life's been threatened, that that's, that's part of the fallen world. And so, so it's something to be regretted. I think what I worry about and what I talk about some in the book is there's a certain element of American gun culture um, that, that can, that, can lead to us having like dehumanizing other people, right? So people that in, in certain parts of American gun culture talk about themselves as the sheep dogs, right? Protecting the sheep, uh, which would be the people who aren't armed from the wolves, right? And so that's just one small example where, where we start seeing ourselves as superior because we're armed and then the, the unarmed people is kind of stupid and needing our protection and then the bad guys are like evil and deserve to die. Um, and so I worry about that view. I'm not, you know, of course there's crime and punishment and criminal justice are important, but if we have a mindset that someone who's a criminal is less human, then we've stepped out of, of a, a biblical view of human nature and our value. Is there any philosophical, psychological link between if I carry a gun with me, am I more prone to insert myself into a situation that I might not otherwise insert myself into? Am I more prone to think of a different solution or that gun becomes the solution and because I have it, I consider no other option in that scenario. Yeah, I think we can tend to that. I think the psychological, some of this evidence has to do with empathy and that if we, if we start seeing people as less than human, we don't, we don't have empathy for them as much. It gets undermined and of course as Christians, empathy is important to a lot of virtues, love, compassion, those sorts of things. But yeah, I think there's this, I mean, of course the research about guns it's, it's not as it's not as robust as we would want. It's starting to get better because there were cuts in funding several years ago, and you're starting to see more of it. But as you can imagine, there are studies. I mean, there's conflicting studies, um, and so I think we're still those things are still emerging. But I think if, as a philosopher in psychology, you know, people that read psychology, and you can sort of think, yeah, you well, you can even just put yourself in someone's shoes and think, I've got this weapon. It's going to be 
that's the easy solution, right? I can stop what's happening with a gun or I can escalate things with a gun. So I think there is some evidence um, that, that that can happen, that when guns are present, violence can escalate. And so it doesn't mean we shouldn't carry them, but it means we should be aware of that. And um, really just means bringing our hearts and minds before God. And if we're, if we're going to carry a gun, if we're going to make that tragic decision in some ways, then we have to make sure that we're not opting too quickly for violence or, like you said, inserting ourselves into something in a way that we shouldn't. Because it's got to be a last resort. I think we, regardless of our views, I think Christians can see that armed or not, just war theorists, pacifists, well, pacifists might not agree, but we can at least agree that if we're going to use violence, it should be as best as we can tell the last resort. You know, if the argument is, <clears throat> I have a gun because I want to protect my home, then that kind of makes a statement, the gun belongs at home. And when I leave the home, I leave the gun. It's there at the home to protect the home from an invader. So mm -hmm. the stand your ground kind of uh, philosophy that says that, my home, my property, I can protect myself and my family from any attack. But once I take that gun with me, uh, am I more prone to shoot or pray? Hmm. What, what if I'm, what if this is, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to put the philosopher's hat on with you, uh, or if this God, is God's way of putting someone in your path that desperately needs salvation, desperately needs the Lord, and he's put you in a position and entrusted you to be the one to present the gospel to this person, and you respond by, <clears throat> because he has a gun and you can outdraw him, or he doesn't know that you have a gun and you shoot him because he's pointing a gun at you and you haven't spoken a word to him, is that a fulfillment of the Great Commission uh, that I should share the gospel in that situation. And can we, uh, we can't legislate this, but we can certainly evaluate our position as to why am I carrying in Walmart? Or when was the last time there was a shootout in Walmart, uh, what, two people fighting over a can of tomato sauce. Okay, that, but, but there are people that, that, that um, because of our system, uh, background checks and, and uh, a change in somebody's, you know, at the, at the time of, of uh, the purchase, you may be perfectly stable and fine. Ten years later, you have a traumatic event in your life, and um, uh, your mental health changes. Yeah. Now, are you somebody that could have passed, or that you're under psychological care? Uh, are you quote unquote mentally fit to make that kind of decision in the moment? And is that what these court cases are about? in taking a look at <clears throat> the psychological condition of, uh, of, of where um, people are. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things there that, that come to mind. One is that we often approach those, those first scenarios, like taking, you know, for taking a gun with us, protect our life, lives of others. But as Christians, we want to have that larger view about the spiritual goods that are relevant, right? And so like even the story we mentioned in the last segment about, you know, the, the woman in Atlanta who shared Christ with uh, the guy who had her at gunpoint and something, you know, he was impacted by that and changed his mind. And so we have to, we have to be willing. I mean, Paul at least said in Romans, he was willing to give up his salvation for the salvation of the Jews, right? That was his salvation and not just his life on earth. Um, we have to, I'm convinced no matter what our views are, we have to at least realize that God may put us in a situation where he asks us to give up our lives for somebody else, either their life, their salvation, their chance to hear the gospel. So we have to keep that in mind. That's the highest good in life, not our continued physical existence. So, and I'm, I'm, as, I'm not saying, you know, that's, that's an easy teaching, right? That's a hard one, but it's seemed pretty clear that that's 
that's what God would have us at least keep in mind. As far as the the system and people, I think, you know, we want to strike a balance. I mean, we we don't want government involved in every aspect of our lives, right? There's the personal liberties and things like that are important. My own kind of one of the, even though my book's not primarily about primarily about policies, it, I do conclude with a few suggestions, and one of those, and I think you can find people across the, the gun rights spectrum who think that the, they're called red flag laws or extreme risk protection orders, so that in a case you may, that you talked about there, that hypothetical case, someone passed a bas- background check but now has some kind of issues, it allows a family member or a healthcare professional or a police officer to, to basically, you know, put, submit a request for the person's guns to be confiscated because they're a risk of themselves or others. It goes before a judge. Um, and then if, if it's found to be without merit, the guns are re- returned to them immediately. It can be two days to two weeks, depending on the on the state, if they have this. But if they are, they lose them for a year, and then they can, after a year, be reevaluated. Uh, the trick with, not the trick, the important thing there is, and the requirement is you've got to have evidence. So you, I, you don't want people making a just a flippant request you know, maybe they're mad at their neighbor for, you know, mowing part of their yard or whatever, and they, you know, have, say they're a danger. So there's, there have to be consequences for a someone who submits that kind of request uh, without evidence. You want due process. But I think some of the states, Maryland I talk about in the book, there are other states where this has actually worked. It's prevented at least potential school shootings. Um, so, so there are things that we can do like that that protect the rights of responsible gun owners but also reduce gun violence. It seems that <clears throat> uh, mental health is becoming a much larger issue, uh, been magnified by this COVID-19 separation, isolation, social distancing, a very bad term yeah. uh, that, that drives towards isolation. Uh, prescriptions for depression, for anxiety are up 40 percent. Uh, suicides are up. Uh, de- pe- people are um, dealing with with some thought life that uh, and some anxious challenges of financial pressures that they didn't have before. Job security, many of those other things. Uh, is there any? In the psychological studies, uh, do uh, counselors have the discussion about gun ownership with the patients they treat? Yeah, I think some do. I'm not. Sh- I mean, but some I I don't think it even necessarily comes up. Now, maybe it. You know, that'd be an interesting question. If um, I don't think there's any sort of requirement. It would be interesting to see what, what kind of code of ethics they have if that's part of it. Um, I think it should be if somebody if somebody is depressed, you know, or, or really struggling maybe with some other kind of mental illness where they could be a, a danger to themselves or others, that's got to be a question that needs to be asked. Um, with as many Christian counselors as there are, uh, not mainstream um, mm-hmm secular counselors, but Christian counselors, uh, should this be a part of the narrative? Should this be something that, uh, in talking to somebody, um, domestic violence comes up a lot, marital issues come up a lot, anger management comes up a lot in pastoral counseling situations in marriages. Uh, I I would think that that, um, uh, the idea of neutralizing uh, just saying, you know what, um, you know, you certainly have a right to own a gun, but uh, maybe a right now during this difficult time, um, would you like to lock it up here in the safe and kind of take it out of the equation? Um, uh, you know, I have a concern. Uh, do you think that would be out of bounds? Yeah, I think that I don't think it would be, especially, I mean, look, as within the church, we're, so if we're, it's a Christian counselor, we're caring for each other, that's that's what we do, right? We're supposed to care for each other. And so if I'm a, 
I mean, to add one more thing to the pastor necessarily or the Christian counselor, but I think we just have to do that, right? If th there is evidence, I look at in the book that when in situations with domestic violence, if there is a gun in the home, um, either there's more likely that it could be used or more likely that the violence will be more intense. Um, if somebody's depressed, you don't want them having access to a gun. Or if I'm a father and I've got a teenager and there's recent research about widespread depression and at least considering suicide among people on, you know, 18 and under during the last few months during the pandemic. I don't want a teenager to be able to make that snap decision and get a parent's gun um, and kill themselves because unfortunately that's much, the guns are the most effective way, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, just safe storage could save a lot of lives. So, but I, yeah, I think that's important. We have to ask that question because it's hard to see how I'm loving the spouse or the children or the other members of that household as brothers and sisters in Christ if I'm not at least trying to deal with the potential lethal situation of a gun. And it's like other things. If you're struggling with a temptation, um, we we try to control. It's one thing we can do is limit availability, right? Control the environment. Somebody who's an alcoholic, we don't let we don't have alcohol in the house. Somebody who's at risk of committing violence to themselves or others, you wouldn't want them to have a, access to a firearm while they're that dangerous. This is such a, uh, uh, almost a tender spot, I think, in, in any discussion. It's like the pastor in, in West Virginia you referred to is, mm -hmm. uh, listen, you can talk to us about adultery, you can talk to us about money, you can talk to us about politics, you can talk to us about uh, er anything else, but don't talk to us about guns. Yeah. Okay? You know, guns have a sacred kind of uh, classification all their own, and I don't think that we take it into consideration. Uh, I think that everyone I know that owns a gun feels perfectly justified. I feel justified uh, to not be a soft target if I know that I'm out speaking and, and uh, there's somebody who wants me uh, dead. I should, um, and, and I've had this conversation with law enforcement uh, who say that the, for me the practical thing is, is you just keep it locked up and if you're uh, going into an area where you know that there's going to be the possibility of difficulty, then you should be wise about it. So I'm not a uh, uh, six-shooter packing, uh, you know, but I don't want to be a soft target either, yeah. but I had never considered it until it became personal. That's the other part of this, is, uh, is part of this debate is only when it becomes personal or you know somebody or it comes close to home, does that change the narrative? And because it changes the narrative, driven to a Baltimore, driven to a, a Columbine, given to, that that then fires up the debate even greater. And the defense then kind of pulls together and says, we're going to link arms and this is going to become immovable. And the Bible plays no part in it. It's really a situational response. Yeah, I think that's right, and that's it's a natural reaction to human nature. We to protect ourselves, those we care about, and so we we go to that. But we, yeah, we've got to bring not just bring God into that, but right, bring it under God's rule. And I think guns are like well, anything. They they're not necessarily idols in and of themselves, but they can become idols for people, just like a sports team or a, I mean, you know. So, it, but I sometimes I wonder. I think guns have. If not not unique, they can be. A, there's a stronger temptation towards that because of the power that they do give. Um, and so, you know, you can not that someone feels godlike, but we're tempted to things that give us more power, right? And, we're, we've been and talking, so that's the yeah. difficulty. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but this mm -hmm. is uh, uh, it was a fascinating read, and it's a fascinating subject for you that want to look at the biblical worldview about God and guns in America. Author Michael Austin, visit IgnitingNation.com, look at today's broadcast schedule and just click on uh, Love the Interview, get the book and get a copy for yourself and have this discussion, uh, whether you're a gun owner or not a gun owner, as to uh, really going back to uh, the, old, uh, the old statement, what would Jesus do? 
Uh, what are we supposed to have in the mind of Messiah when it comes to this particular issue? Uh, Michael Austin, thank you for taking on an insurmountable challenge uh, in an unwinnable debate. Yeah, thank you. So God bless you and thank you for doing this. We're going to take a short break and when we come back we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <laughs>